you for that. He's gone, friend, but he's not lost. Right. Know where he is, sitting at the right hand of the Father in the glory world. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Is this microphone on, Brother Cody? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Good crowd, good spirit, good service. I'm so glad that you're here on the greatest day in human history, and I'll get to that in just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. I'll read down through verse number 4. Before I do, let's bow our heads and I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness and your compassion. The great privilege, the great privilege that I have to be saved. And I thank you for saving me 26 years ago. And I thank you, dear Lord, for calling me to preach and that that high calling allows me to pastor this church and preach to these folks. And I want to thank you for the privilege I have. Every day is the Lord's Day, and I love church. I love being in church. The privilege I have every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and other times to be in the house of God. But today of all days, as we reflect on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Muhammad dead, uh, died, and he's still dead. Amen. And, uh, Lord, there are others that have died. They're still dead. Joseph Smith is still dead. But Jesus is alive forevermore. I'm so thankful that our faith is not founded on religion, but on the ravaging of our Lord on the cross, on his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Lord, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray they get saved. I pray that you would draw the saint closer to you on today of all days as we reflect on the resurrection of Jesus. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Look in verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I want you to pay particular attention to this next phrase. I declare unto you the gospel. I believe... And I trust you do as well, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Amen. And what the Apostle Paul is about to tell us is the truth of the gospel. <coughs> Not what religion says, but what God says. Right. He said also, which I preached unto you. Let me say this, in 2019 America, we need more gospel preaching. Amen. He then says this, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Now notice this phrase. He says, I declare unto you the gospel. Then in chapter 2, verse 1, he says this, by which also ye are saved. So the gospel is connected to salvation. Friend, if you don't believe the gospel, you're not saved. Now I want you to notice what he says. I'd like to give some explanation as I read. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, I'd like to clarify something because as a pastor, as a preacher, many have come to me before and said, Brother Sam, I believe I'm saved. I hope I'm saved. But I don't remember the exact date. I don't remember the exact time. I don't remember what I said, and I'm concerned about that. Well, the Bible is not saying that you hear the gospel, receive the gospel, and then every day for the rest of your life, remember every detail about the day in which you got saved. He's not saying if you keep in memory. What he's saying is, I want to remind you of exactly what the gospel is, and how it saves. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Now notice this, unless you believed in vain. Did you know all around Evansville, around Henderson, around Owensboro, around Newburgh, around this greater uh, tri-state area, churches are full of religion. Right. And I'm not going to make any apology for declaring Landmark Baptist Church is not an institution of religion but a gospel lighthouse. If you don't believe in the gospel, your faith is in vain. That's what the Bible says. Now notice verse number three. 
Now, he said, I delivered unto you the gospel. Here it is. I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Just a few months ago, we celebrated Christmas. There's a great song that a songwriter wrote regarding the birth of our Lord. He was born to die upon Calvary. His birth in Bethlehem was just the beginning. It was leading him to a life that would end on the cross to pay for the sins of humanity. He died for our sins. By the way, completely, 100% dead for our sins. When he was in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he was not in a trance. He was dead. He gave his life. He drained his blood. He yielded the ghost for your sins and mine. The Bible then says that he was buried. He was buried. Have you ever had a loved one depart? They're buried. That's what Jesus did. He was buried. By the way, the Bible would continue to say, according to the scriptures, do you not remember what Jesus said when he was in his earthly ministry? He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, that the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth. Now, I don't want to be unkind or offensive, but it's hard to get three days out of a Friday. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Jonah was not picturing in the whale. He was in the whale three days and three nights. That's what the Bible says. I'm telling you, our Lord was dead and he was buried. Now to you and I, that means final. But to him, it's just the beginning. And notice what the Bible says. He was buried and that he rose again rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now listen to me very carefully. The Bible says in Psalm 118 verse 24, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad that I'm alive on April the 21st, 2019. This is his day. I rejoice in it. I rejoice in my health. I rejoice in my church family. I rejoice in the breakfast we had. I rejoice in the choir singing. I rejoice in fellowshipping with you. I rejoice with my wife that I have a wonderful wife and a home and a family. I rejoice that we're in the house of God on a Sunday. But can I make an application? He was buried and he rose again the third day. And let me tell you something, friend. That is a day that he made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I will tell you something this morning. No, no day, no day changed the world like the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. There's been no day like it. There's been no day since it. It's greater than the day of his birth. As great a day as that is. That's a pretty good day when a virgin who knows no man conceives of the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ, and gives birth. I'd say that's a pretty great event. That's not the greatest event, not the greatest day. I remember reading in the Gospels concerning the baptism of Jesus and the dove descending upon him and the voice from heaven which says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. What a great day that Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to proper baptism. Not because he needed to be get, get saved, but because we needed to get saved and he was laying a groundwork and a foundation for Bible doctrine. It's greater than the feeding of the multitude. That was a great day. I wasn't there. You can tell by looking at me, I wish I was there. But anytime there's fish and hush puppies for enough for 20,000 people, I want to be there. What a great day. Twelve baskets remaining. Not the greatest day, though. 
I remember reading in the Gospels there was a day when Jesus was traveling in his ministry and there was a blind man on the side of the road. He begged God to heal him. And he did. What a great day. Can you imagine seeing a blind man healed and his sight restored? I remember reading about a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. I've read about a deaf man who couldn't hear a sound. And the first thing he ever heard was the sweet voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a great day, but it's not the greatest day. <clears throat> no, I remember reading in the Gospels about a dark, stormy, horrific night on the Sea of Galilee. I remember the disciples fearing that death was soon to come to them. And... In the middle of the night, Jesus came walking on the water. He calmed that storm. That's a great day. What a great night. Could you imagine having been in that boat? But that's not the greatest. I remember reading in John how he turned the water into wine. What a great day. First miracle he ever did, but that's, that's not the greatest. And he had an occasion to read John chapter number 11. That's exciting. That's when his dear friend Lazarus dies. And word comes to Jesus, Lazarus, our friend, is dead. He goes back into the town of Bethany. And Martha meets him right at the entrance of the city and falls at his feet and said, our brother Lazarus is dead. Jesus said, he may be dead, but I've got good news. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he walks into that city. And Lazarus had already been dead three days. Therefore he stinketh. And he resurrected him. He resurrected him from corruption. Showing that Jesus truly is the only one that can bring life to the truly dead. Amen. Great day. Can you imagine a great day? That's not the greatest day. That's not the greatest day. I, I've read in the Gospels. Have you read about that wonderful day? when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration and he is glorified, he is deified, he is transfigured right before him. All three of them, all three of them in their Bible writings make mention of this event. I think John's might be the greatest where he said... He became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Peter talked about seeing the Lord transfigured on that glorious day in his epistle. That's not, that's not the greatest day. I remember the week previous to the resurrection, Palm Sunday. What a great day when Jesus makes his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. That's a great day, but that's not the greatest day. What about when he had the last supper with his disciples and thus instituted an ordinance for us to remember the great price that was paid for our sins? What a great event that happened that night, but that's not the greatest event. What about when he crossed the brook Kidron and went down off the Mount of Olives and went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed as if it were great drops of blood. And in this garden, he said, Father, not thy will be done, or not mine be done, but thy will be done. What a great night when he who for the joy that was set before him willingly accepted the cross. By the way, what he was accepting when he said, let this cup pass from me, he wasn't talking about the cross I preached last week. He was talking about the one and only time in human history when the Son and the Father would be separated. He turned his back on his only begotten Son to turn his face towards you and towards me. What a great night, but that's not the greatest night. He's arrested, carried off to Caiaphas, the high priest's house. On the way, Peter, trying to rescue the Lord, took a sword, cut off Malchus's ear. 
Jesus just held Peter back, reached down, picked that ear up off the ground and put it back on Malchus. Proving on his way to the cross, I'm the miracle working God of heaven. He gets to Caiaphas' house. He's tried. He's condemned to death. He carries his cross. He's nailed to that cross. His beard is plucked out of his face. Let me just say something as a preacher. That shroud of Turin is a lie. Right. You ever heard about that shroud of Turin? Well, excuse me, it, it claims to have the impression of Jesus. There's just one problem with that shroud. It has a man who had a beard. Well, excuse me, let God be true and every man a liar. Do you have a beard, sir? Imagine it plucked out by the roots so that your face is ripped apart. The Bible says his visage, his appearance was so marred, he looked like he wasn't even human. Right. I'm sick to death of sissy religion. Amen. I said I'm sick of it. Yeah, right. Little dainty Jesus hanging on a cross with his head bowed like he suffocated to death. He died with the weight of sin and the weight of the world on his back. <coughs> he became sin who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You say, Brother Sam, what's so great about the crucifixion? It is finished! Amen. Great day. Great day. <laughs> On that Wednesday from noon to three, darkness was over all the land. 3.01, Joseph is begging the body. <clears throat> You ever wondered why the women had to show up on the day of his resurrection to anoint his body? The high Sabbath, this is the week of the Passover, was about to begin in three hours. All they could do was throw some cloth around him and get him in the tomb so that they could begin the Sabbath and not violate the law. Very interesting to me, Brother Hall, what they did not realize was the veil had already been rent from top to bottom. In the grave he goes, Wednesday 6 p.m. to Thursday 6 p.m. Thursday 6 p.m. to Friday 6 p.m. Friday 6 p.m. Now wait a minute, he didn't resurrect. He didn't resurrect Saturday at 6 p.m. The Bible says he wouldn't be in there but three days and three nights. If he goes one minute past three days and three nights, he's corrupt. He stinketh. He doesn't have the victory of the resurrection over death. But up from the grave he arose, stomped the head of the devil, took the keys of hell and death, and lives forevermore. Yeah. By the way, the evening and the morning were the first day. So on the first day of the week, he was up out of that tomb long before he ever talked to Mary. The wee hours of that morning. Hey, Brother Sam, what's the big deal? The big deal is this is the day the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it because there is no day in the history of the world like the day that Jesus walked out of the tomb. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> it's not a day just to be celebrated because it's a holiday. By the way, Baptists were celebrating the resurrection long before the tradition of Easter. Right. I'm trying to tell you this is a day to rejoice in because it changed the history of the world and it'll change your life. Damn. Right. But Paul made it very clear that you better receive <clears throat> what happened during this week in order to be saved. Now, if you'll allow me, I just want to have a fit. <laughs> I just want to preach and have a good time because I'm saved. I'm born again. <laughs> This is the day the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice 
and be glad in it. Amen. Why are you happy, Brother Sam, about the resurrection? Just let me give you a few things. Have a good time. Get in on it if you want to, but I'm going to rejoice in this day. It proves the scriptures Amen. to be right. That's right. What's the big deal, Brother Sam? It's just the day of his resurrection. Well, it's just the day that proves that what he said was right. Yeah, now, let me tell you something, friend. He didn't have to resurrect to prove he was right. He resurrected because he's right. It was a done deal. It was going to happen. But for your sake and for mine, he resurrected on that third day. And it proves that the word of God is true. Let's go all the way to the beginning. Genesis chapter number 2. Adam and Eve are told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In chapter number 3 of Genesis, they did. And they plunged all man into sin. Paul would later say in the New Testament, Whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all of sin. And so God comes walking in the cool of the day. He says, Adam, where art thou? Now, God wasn't trying to find Adam. God knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was. Dead. Adam just knew something had happened. I don't think he fully understood exactly what happened until the day of the judgment when God judges man, God judges woman, God curses mankind, God curses the devil, and then escorts Adam and Eve out of the garden of life because they are dead now. Hopeless. That's a tragic day. Oh, it's a great day when God, out of the dust of the ground, created man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And what a great day it was when he took a rib out of the side of Adam and created and helped meet a wife for the husband and created the woman. What a great day that was. What a great day it was just watching Adam name the animals. But he sinned. He sinned. He sinned. And therefore he was cursed. And he was separated from God. And all the way back on that tragic day came a ray of hope. When the Bible says, God said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Right there he's declaring. And the very next thing he does is he makes a coat of animal skin cover up the nakedness and the sin of Adam and Eve. You come all the way to the New Testament, you'll find that he was a lamb led to the slaughter. He was made of the seed of woman. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. But that was no ordinary man that came out of her womb. That was the God man. He's not the son of Joseph. He's the son of God. And he lived 33 and a half sinless years. He who knew no sin would become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And right in Genesis, he said, Devil, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Now, not a lot is explained in Genesis in this chapter number three, but pictures from then on about the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world. Read Genesis, read Exodus, read Leviticus, read Numbers, read Deuteronomy, read Joshua and see the scarlet thread coming out of the <laughs> wicked city of Jericho showing that no matter who you are, in this case a whore from Jericho, 
is loved by an almighty God and he would even save her. Aren't you glad? I don't care who you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care where you're from. If you're breathing God's air, you're a candidate to get saved. Right. Right. Well, you get to the book of Psalms and there's another prophecy, not only the prophecy that Jesus would come and I don't have time to get into all of that and the prophecy of his crucifixion, but you have the prophecy of his resurrection in the Old Testament. Right. Because the psalmist said in chapter 16, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, right. neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. In the Old Testament, it is prophesied that he would resurrect from the dead. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 61, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. If you read Matthew 16, 21, Matthew 17, 23, Mark chapter 8, 31, Mark 9, 31, Luke 9, 22, John 2, 19 through 22. In every one of those occasions, he said, destroy this temple and in three days, I will build it again. And he did. I like what God told Paul to say in the book of Romans regarding the testimony of Abraham. Comparing Abraham to the situation, he said Abraham was fully persuaded that what God promised, he was able to perform. Amen. When God said, you destroy the temple and I'll build it again, he meant it. I'm telling you, Jesus said he would die, resurrect from the dead. And he did. That book you hold in your hand is the inerrant, infallible, indestructible word of the living God. Amen. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Let God be true and every man a liar. He's not slack concerning his promises. The resurrection proves the word of God to be right. I want to rejoice in that. Because friend, if he was right about that, he's right about everything. Amen. And this is your hope right here. Amen. Number two. Number two. I'm just having a good time. Enjoy it if you want to. I'm having a fit. I'm wearing out, but I'm having a fit. <laughs> Number two, it's the perfection of our salvation. I'm going to rejoice in that. You said the perfection of our salvation. Yeah, his dying on the cross wasn't enough. I said his dying on the cross wasn't enough. Right. What, Brother Sam? You just said it was a great day. You said he that knew no sin became sin for us. He died on the cross, shed his blood, said it is finished. Are you telling us there's more? Yeah, because the gospel isn't how that he died. It's how he died, was buried, and rose again. Amen. Now, you're already in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Drop down to verse number 12. Let's see what the Word of God says. Ch chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Let me tell you something, friend. I don't care how many books Bill O'Reilly writes. He's wrong. I'm sick to death of human authors thinking they have a right to give us the lowdown on the greatest day in human history. This is the record I'm going to believe. What's that book series he writes, The Death of Abraham Lincoln? He talks about Jesus. Oh, brother, someone said to me, Brother Sam, did you know Bill O'Reilly wrote a book? I said, I said, yes, I did. They said, have you read it? I said, no, I have 66 other books that talk about the subject. Yeah. By an infallible author. Man. Now, Brother Curtis, you're a preacher, I'm a preacher. You just can't help yourself sometimes. So I'm in the store with my wife. I'm in the store every day with my wife. So I thought I'd go to the book section. 
And there it was, Bill O'Reilly's book. I have the one about Abraham Lincoln. I, does anyone, I don't even remember the title of it, uh, The Killing or the Whatever. So I pick up The Killing of Jesus or whatever the book is, and I go to the back where he tries to explain where Jesus is. And I'm going to tell you right now, he don't believe in resurrection. He believes in the tale that was told that some believe. He rose from the dead. He ain't the first one. Paul said there be some that say he rose not from the dead. Right. Because it's the greatest day. It's the greatest miracle in human history. And it defies human logic. That's why your faith has to be in God. You walk by faith, not by sight. Now notice this. But, there, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Look in verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Let me tell you something, friend. It's just about five minutes to 12. <coughs> if I didn't believe in the resurrection, I have wasted your time. Let's go home and watch baseball. Let's go home and play football. Go to your family reunion, because this was a waste of your time, if he be not risen. But he is. So my preaching's not in vain. Notice this. Your faith is also vain. Let me tell you something, friend. If your faith doesn't include the resurrected Lord, you're lost and on your way to a devil's hell. All right. Because I'll rejoice in a day that perfects salvation. It completes it. It finishes it. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Now notice this verse, verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Now notice the scariest phrase in all of the Bible. Ye are yet in your sins. Now wait a minute. That's the scariest phrase in the word of God if the reaction, re resurrection was not a reality. Oh, but it is. Amen. Now notice verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. I was reflecting on my mother the other day. She's in heaven. She died five years ago. If God didn't resurrect, I don't know where mama is. any more than you know where your loved one is if he resurrected not. They're perished. They're in hell. That's it. They're done. Over. No hope. Notice the next verse. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. He said without the resurrection, this is the best it gets. And if this is the best it gets, what a misery it is. Notice the next phrase. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He is risen. It perfects our salvation. It completes our salvation. Paul would say in Romans chapter 4 verse 25 that he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for what? What purpose? He tells us justification. You can't be declared saved if he doesn't resurrect. Right. Let me tell you how salvation works. He's born. He's born. The Lamb of God born in Bethlehem. God's still waiting. And he lives 33 and a half years. And he heals the sick. He raises the dead. He gives sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, speech to the mute, strength to the lame. He feeds the multitudes on several occasions with bread and with fish. He walks on the water. He calms the storms. He heals a maniac. <coughs> God's waiting. And he's led from Gethsemane, Caiaphas' is home, from Caiaphas to Pilate. Pilate has to stand before the Jews, Barabbas and Jesus. They choose Barabbas and yield Jesus up to be crucified. Then Jesus carries his cross 
and he's nailed to it. And he hangs naked between heaven and earth, bearing in his own body the sins of the world. And he dies for our sins according to the scriptures. And God's waiting. He's waiting. And then comes Joseph of Arimathea and, oh, by the way, Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. By the way, if someone doesn't get saved the first time you talk to them, there's hope they'll get saved. Yeah. John 3, he walks away lost. The end of John, he walks into Pilate as a disciple to help Joseph marry Jesus. They put him in a borrowed tomb where never a man had laid. God's waiting. And day one, he's waiting. And day two, he's waiting. And day three, he's waiting. And then up from the grave, he arose. And God says, justified. He died, buried, <coughs> rose again. And now we can be saved. You say, Brother Sam, it's not a big deal. Oh, my soul, you're going to hell without it. I'm not trying to be unkind, but you'll go to a devil's hell without the resurrection of Jesus. It's a big deal. And this is the day he made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Number three, it gives peace and sleep. My mama's dead. No, she's not. She's asleep. She's never been more alive than she has right now. Wendy's mom and dad are in the glory world and they've never been more alive than they are right now. And you have departed friends and family. Their bodies may be in the ground. Oh, but they're in the presence with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is a big deal because I can have hope in sleep. The Bible says in our text, if you went to verse 51, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Paul would later say in 1 Thessalonians 4, I will not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. John said in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I am the he that liveth and was dead. I like it. I am he that liveth and was dead. For the whole, I like that over in John 12. You're familiar with this. John 11, Jesus resurrects Lazarus. Remember that, Brother Jason? Chapter 12, they're having a supper. And I just like, Brother Curvis, what God tells John to say. The Bible says there, at this supper, Martha was there serving Mary was there sitting, and Lazarus. He just could have said Lazarus was there. But he had to put in a little redemption. Lazarus, which had been dead. Jesus is just saying in Revelation, I am he that liveth and was dead. I was dead, just as dead as you'll be, and I'm alive. Then he says this, I am alive forevermore. Amen. <coughs> and have the keys of, this got on me about a year ago when I was studying. It's amazing how we take verses and just turn words. 
For example, we go around saying that we're a body, soul, and spirit. But that ain't what the Bible says. Why is it we're always putting the flesh first? Paul said, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body. You say, Brother Sam, is that a big deal? Uh, well, he didn't say body, soul, and spirit. He said, get it right, spirit, soul, body last. Now, wait a minute. I have to believe that's true in Revelation. He said, I don't have the keys of death and hell. He said, I have the keys of hell and death. Now, let me do my best in just a brief moment of time to give you what that means. Hell is the ultimate death. Right. 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 Now, he was dead and is alive forevermore. And he is telling us that though your body may yield up the ghost, and though your body may fall asleep, and though your body, in a sense, will die and be buried, you do not die. I'm resurrected, and you're alive forevermore, just like I am. He said, but that wasn't the real problem. Remember the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We always run to physical death, but that's not what Jesus is saying is the real problem. You have to go to the Revelation where it says, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now look at me and listen. This is the second death. Right. He's saying, I was separated, but I'm not now. And you were bound and condemned to separation, but you're not now. I have the keys of hell. I have the keys of death. And not only does my resurrection give power in a physical sense, our earthly bodies, though they're dead, one day will be reunited with our soul. But he is saying, I took the keys from the devil. I have the keys of hell. My resurrection gives you hope in eternal life. And you'll never perish. Peace and sleep. I remember a song the old cathedral quartet used to sing. They carried him away to an unfamiliar grave. They rolled the stone in place, <laughs> but not for long. For on the third day, as Mary came to that place, she found his clothes lying there, but he was gone. The story does not end. This is where it all begins. <laughs> because he lives... We too can have new life. And though we all must face death and the grave, we too shall rise because death has died. Now look at me and listen. This is what happened when he resurrected. He put to death. Death. I said he put to death, the last thing that needed to die, death. Which means death doesn't come over the believer. Life, life is in our future. Amen. It's so deep, I don't even feel like I'm adequately preaching the truth. I'm trying to say he killed death. Peace and sleep. If you have a departed loved one, they're still very much alive. And if you died today, you're saved by the gospel. You're absent from the body. You're present with the Lord. You're very much alive. Now, I'm, I'm going to close with this. I'm just going to rejoice because now I have the privilege of seeing them. Isn't that the end result? Face to face, I shall behold him. That's what the songwriter said. In John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also.
Paul would later say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, This we say then unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Don't forget the last verse. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. In John chapter 19, or it's not John, Job. The greatest statement I believe made by Old Testament or New Testament. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Amen. He lives. He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Though after my body worms destroy, after, after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I be. I remember the day I got married, June 21, 1997. A great day in my life. It was a great day in my wife's life. <laughs> if you don't believe, just ask me and I'll tell you. <laughs> and I remember being in a side room with my brother, my best man, my dad, who had a hand in the ceremony, ordained preacher, and Dr. Don Green. And then the music plays, and out we walk. And then all these other people I cared nothing for just walk and take forever and take forever. All these folks in the wedding. And then we got to wait for a cute little girl to walk up and throw flowers everywhere. And then we got to wait for a little boy to walk up bearing the ring. Just it took forever. I didn't mind it. It just took forever. That ain't who I was there to see. <laughs> and then, you know. The music starts, boom, 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 boom. It gets all real emotional. And that back door flew open. And there she was. Well, you know, my life, I mean that. The beautiful woman I'm going to marry. And down the aisle she walks. That's pretty emotional. That's the greatest sight this side of heaven I've ever seen. But one day, this body is going to cease to exist because it's sinful. These eyes are going to close. My spiritual eyes are going to open. I'll see him who gave his life for me. Or, or by the grace of God, and perhaps in your life too, we're not going to see death. We're going to look up one day. We're going to see a cloud. He that resurrected descending on that cloud. And we're going to hear a shout as if it were the voice of a trumpet. John said it would be these words come up hither and your eyes will look on him. Whoever lives to make intercession for you. It's a great day, friend. Some of you sourpuss Baptists need to get over it and rejoice in this day. It's a good day. Get your mind off your work. Get your mind off your family. Get your mind off your bills. Get your mind off your body. Get your mind off of Trump. Get your mind off of politics. And get them on him. It's a great day. I rejoice today because it proves that what I read every day of my life is right. It proves the scriptures to be right. It perfects my salvation. I was born a dead man, September the 18th, 1975. I went to the altar of Victory Baptist Church, a dead man on March the 28th, 1993, and began to live forevermore. Number three, it gives peace and sleep. I have a picture of my mom and my dad in my office. When I see that picture of my mother, I know she's forever with him. Oh, she's out of my eyesight. 
And I have peace that one day I'll see her again. And friend, it gives us the privilege of seeing him. Face to face we shall behold him far beyond the starry skies. Face to face in all his glory, we will see him and live with him by and by. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, how Christ died.